All right, Title 42 is set to expire in just two days, and the number of migrants at our southern border continues to grow. Joining us this morning, once again, immigration lawyer Saman Nasseri to explain what we can expect moving forward. Saman, good morning. Thanks good morning. for joining us. Uh, we're counting down the days, literally. Everybody is. Tell us what happens when Title 42 comes to an end on Thursday. Uh, our, our borders are going to get flooded by an extra few thousand people every single day of people just trying to get in to claim asylum because there is no longer this rapid, quick turn away or refusal of people, which, to be fair, has really only been used a third of the time in the last year or so. But as what everybody is hearing on the other side of the border is get to the border, you get asylum now. Can you put that into perspective when you say a thousand more per day? What does that mean in terms of put me back to pre-pandemic uh, levels? Put me back maybe uh, five years ago. What this would mean on a day-to-day -day basis compared to what it's going to look like Thursday, and 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 why? So, so what the prediction is is they're going to have about ten thousand people hitting just. And this is just the San Ysidro border. Right. Ten thousand people hitting the San Ysidro border, up from about the six to seven thousand we're at right now. So almost double. Mm. And pre-pandemic, we were just below about 5,000. So like we were three to 4,000 pre-pandemic. Mm. At 10,000, we don't have the manpower. We don't have the manpower now at 7,000. So Yeah, we, we don't have the manpower. We've talked about this before, but we, we knew this was coming, right? We knew this was coming, but there is still, I mean, you can't just pull ICE officers and Border Patrol agents and USCIS agents out of thin air. So you have to remember, I mean, this isn't the only avenue of immigration. So you, can, you can't cancel everything else happening in the immigration world and allocate all the resources to this. And this is, you're going to overburden the borders. Mm. So you're going to have people sitting in custody for weeks before they even get processed. I mean, it's, they're not, they're going to cross the border. Their family's not going to hear from them for maybe two to three weeks before they get processed somewhere. There was a time when this happened, you would think that they're coming from Mexico into the U.S. and then Central America into the mm -hmm. U.S. Now it's literally worldwide. Um, I wanted to go back to the question of why, uh, but also where are these folks coming come from? Because they're coming from literally all over the world. They're from China, Africa, the Caribbean, everywhere. Everywhere. Did yeah. word get out or somehow that changed in the last couple of years and before? It's, it's what they're seeing on the news and on social media, that they can get in. Their, their belief is, this is, and I hear that from the families when they're looking for their family members who are in custody is, hey, my, my, per, my family member just crossed the border. Yeah. Where are they? they? We were told they would just get asylum and be able to be released to an uncle or an aunt or a cousin sure. or someone in, uh, in San Diego or in Chicago or in New York, whatever it might be. How come they're still in custody? And they're, they're annoyed that they're in custody. Yeah. But they're hearing that you cross the border, you're in. Wow. So much of this country, Salman, is, uh, it is built on immigrants. And yeah. that's people coming here. Um, they're looking for a, a new start at life. So what are the options for these people? I mean, I, we've had you on for so many years. and. I don't know what the solution would be because it just seems year to year to year it, it's getting worse. We need to raise the caps. So there needs to be the caps need to get raised on the family-based immigration cases and the employment-based immigration cases and the refugee programs. I mean, we are years behind on caps. I mean, if you petition for a sibling and you're from Mexico, China, or India, or the Philippines, you're talking 15 to 20 years so your sibling can come into the United States. If you petition for your child, as a U.S. citizen, and the child is over 21, you're talking 15, 20 years before your kid can come into the U.S. I mean, these are outrageous caps and delays that are sitting between, behind the immigration process. We need to figure out a way to streamline the immigration process. People right now are filing three applications with the same information to three different agencies to get a green card. Why? Want, before we let you go, because uh, this could go on for forever, this conversation, but in terms of, of how these folks are getting this, inf is there misinformation out there from social media and from whatever sources they're getting their intel from? Uh, and once they're there, is this a case-by-case -case thing? Is everybody getting in eventually, or not everybody's getting in, or, or how does that work exactly? Not everyone is getting in. There, there's absolutely Everybody thinks they're going to get in, yes. but not everybody will. There's definitely misinformation out there. One is you will be taken into custody most likely. So be prepared to be in custody for weeks, maybe months, before mm. you're able to get released. You, are do, you do not have a viable claim for asylum just because you come from a poor country or there's gang violence or problems. 
that is not a viable claim for asylum because relocation is an option. People say, why can't you live somewhere else in your country? Mm -hmm. That's what the judges will say. That's what the asylum officers will say. The belief is my country is ugly for me. It's poor. It's dangerous. I need to come to the U.S. They'll let me in. That is not true. Wow. Okay. Come on. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking to you again very soon. Yeah. We appreciate the time and your expertise. Thanks for having me. Thank right. you.